Hebrews chapter 7, please. Hebrews chapter 7. And Lord willing, this will be the last time in a while. I'm sure some of you will sigh with relief. Um, but our plan is to finish Hebrews chapter 7 today. Let me ask you a question as we start. And we've asked it a few times now. Can you remember, what is God's ultimate desire for people? To say it again? Drawing near to God. That is according to Hebrews chapter 7. That they should draw near to Him. And that is also then the key idea here in Hebrews 7. Drawing near to God and drawing nearer to God, obviously, as believers. We've seen this from verses 18 and 19. It says there, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. God's heart's desire for true believers those who are trusting in Jesus Christ, is that we should continue this drawing nearer to him as long as we live the Christian life here on earth. That is God's goal in all that he does for us and with us. That we might come into his presence, experience his presence in what we do. In fact, this drawing near to God is the essence of Christianity. And if this is so, drawing near to God is our highest experience now and will also be so for all eternity. What we see now through at last dimly, we will see fully face to face with, with, through Jesus Christ in glory to come. In fact, there's nothing better than that. And it should therefore be our highest purpose in life. This is what we believers must strive for with all our hearts and minds and soul. Drawing close to God. Coming so close to Him that there is nothing between me and Him. And we saw last time that when the writer to the Hebrews talks about drawing near to God, it is not so much in the physical sense or physical distance. Sometimes people... So they want to go and pray and then they go to church and they feel that is the place where God is and they need to physically draw near to God in the church building. But that is not so much what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about here. Because God is omnipresent. And because of that, it means he's everywhere present. He is very close to us already in the physical sense. In every possible situation you can imagine yourself to be in anywhere in the world. We would should rather look at this as tuning into or focusing your heart and mind and soul on his presence or his reality, his essence, in such a way that you will become vividly aware of his glorious presence all around you and in your life. Now, obviously, that is the work of God, the Holy Spirit. He switches us on, but... We also play a role in this, in sanctification, that we need to make a will's decision to draw near to God as his people. Therefore, we must define our closeness to God in a better way, and that is in relational terms. I've said that last time also. And I use the example of a good marriage. People growing and drawing closer and closer to each other and enjoying each other more and more as they grow older. And obviously not the other way around. But that goes for any kind of a relationship you have with people, with friends. Drawing closer to them. And obviously the big thing here is trust. Trusting more and more drawing closer and closer to them. Not just using people for my own good and for my purposes, but drawing close to them 
for their sake, and it is the same with God. So it is possible to draw very near to God. You can come so close to him that you will develop a deep love for God. And as I said, through the eye of faith, we haven't fully realized this yet. This is not fully realized yet. We will even be able to see him face to face through the eye of faith. And obviously this is possible through one person only. His glorious Son, your dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In God, Jesus has come, or in Jesus, God has come very close to us. He is the exact representation of His being, the radiance of God's glory in human form. God, perfect and complete. His final self-revelation to us from for all time and eternity. Hey, and I've, we said this last time, but I say it again because it encourages my heart also. That is why Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters. Now, who are they? Holy brothers and sisters. Believers, Believers Christians, who share in the heavenly calling. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. And Hebrews 12 verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now Hebrews 7 highlights the same thing for us. So let's read it. We haven't read it yet. So let's read Hebrews chapter 7 for the last time. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a far better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has, has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. The last time we saw that Jesus Christ introduced or introduces a far better hope. Uh, we can draw near to God because Jesus Christ introduced a far better hope. Today we carry on and we say, Jesus Christ's priesthood is far better because it is established by God's oath and also that we can draw near to God because that priesthood is established by God's oath. Look there at verses 20 and 21. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Now important, as I've pointed out before, important to understand here that the writer to the Hebrews does not suggest that God's oath is more reliable or valid than his normal bare word. Obviously not. God's word is true. And all his promises are true. No question about that. Why then the necessity of an oath here? Why does God swear an oath concerning Jesus' priesthood? Especially, 
since it is not that the rest of God's word is less true. It's when God makes an eternal transactions that he has chosen to do so with an oath. God's oath does not represent greater truthfulness, but it puts the emphasis on permanence. Let me explain. We've seen already a few times that the Levitical priest ministered in the temple on a temporary basis. They were mortal like you and me. So when they died, what happened? Their sons had to take their place. They were also sinful people. So they always had to offer sacrifices for themselves first before they were qualified to offer sacrifices for other people. And then the, the, even the sacrifices themselves only had a certain temporary effectiveness. So they had to be repeated over and over again. So important to understand that God intended for that priesthood to operate that way. And that God never planned for it to be perfect or to be permanent. And it was never established with an oath. It was to be a temporary measure only until Jesus, the real priest, came. So those who still want to observe the Old Testament customs and practices today, I think directly denies the greater reality God wanted to communicate through those rituals. Jesus, the only Savior of the world. And we must emphasize again today that all the other servants of God, talking here about leaders and pastors and elders in the local church, are at best temp a temporary measure in God's kingdom at the moment. They may show you who Jesus is in a very dim way. And they may at best point you in the right direction concerning spiritual things. But they are not the real thing. They are mortal and sinful. Their ministries were not established by an oath. And therefore, they in themselves cannot bring you closer to God. Only Jesus can. So don't ever make the mistake to trust too much in people. If you put too much trust in people, I tell you, you are going to be very disappointed at some stage. They are going to fail you. And they are going to hurt you. In fact, it's not fair to expect people to be in the place of God. They can't stand in his place. Here's wisdom today. It is Jesus who enables you to draw near to the Father because his priesthood is eternal, forever, and permanent. His priesthood reaches beyond the limits of time and space and sin and mortality into the realm of God himself. His priesthood, his ministry was established by God's oath. Hey. Peter said in Acts chapter 2 verse 23, when he preached on the day of Pentecost, he said this. This man, talking about Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. His predestination. His predetermined plan. In line with his oath. He was a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What else in the Christian life has God established with an oath? Important, Christian, you should know this. Your salvation. Look at Hebrews 6, verses 13 and 14. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, 
I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. Abraham had incredible faith despite all his failings. We know that. The encouraging thing here is though that Abel, uh, Abraham did make spiritual progress and Abel, uh, Abraham grew stronger in the faith. He learned to trust God more and more as he progressed in his life. So when the day of testing came for him, when God commanded him to go and offer up his own dear son Isaac, the son of God's promise on the altar, Abraham did so because he believed that God would make another plan. That God would remain faithful to his promise. He argued that God could raise Isaac from the dead. And you know what? God was incredibly gracious to Abraham after that. He confirmed his promise to Abraham with an oath. Hebrews 6, verses 16 and 17, again. Men swear by someone greater than himself. The oath confirms uh, what is said and puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. Oh, my brother and sister, it was for our benefit that God swore that oath. Who are the heirs of that special promise God made to Abraham? Who are Abraham's true descendants? His true children. But differently, who is the real Israel of God? Believers from all the nations around the world, including Jewish believers, obviously, but believers. It was chosen before the foundation of the world. Galatians 3, 3 verse 29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Read that and take it to heart. Now, if God's promise to Abraham was sure concerning his son Isaac, and God went to all the trouble to confirm it with an oath for your benefit, to end all questions and doubt about your eternal security, why should you ever doubt your eternal salvation? God has promised it in various places in the word, and God has confirmed it by an oath because he wanted to emphasize the eternal nature of your salvation. Amen. Well, I say it to Christians, and I say it for your encouragement, and that's why it's in the Bible also. So it's because Christ's priesthood is established by God's oath that you can draw near to God now and for all eternity. Because of this oath, though, Jesus becomes the guarantee of a better covenant. Hebrews 7 verse 22. Look there, we read it earlier on. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee, the surety of a better covenant. And the point here is that the better priest guarantees a better covenant. I remember when I was a... Oh, I don't know how old I was. I don't think I, I, think I was even 21 yet. So I don't think I was a teenager anymore, but I was like 20 or so, or 19 or 20. And I wanted to go and buy myself a car, a new one, little car, a Fiat 128. Remember those cars? Fiat 128, I see Herman smiling and laughing, a little Fiat 128. But this was a more advanced model. It was one of those square Fiat 128s. So I went to the car dealer and I did it on higher purchase, signed the contract and so on, but then they found out that I was not 21 yet and that my salary was a little bit on the low side. <laughs> so, what to do? Daddy, Papa, please help. He had to sign as 
we had to sign surety for that deal. Meaning that I would repay the car, but he signed surety that the car will be repaid. If anything goes wrong in the contract and so on, he would take full responsibility for the debt incurred by me. So that contract, really, when it was signed, was only as good as the surety that was given. My father's signature that he would repay the car if I don't. Jesus, likewise, is the guarantee of a better covenant by which he secures eternal life for you. He himself has become surety for it. If Jesus, the God-man, stands surety for something, you better know that it is secure. In fact, all God's promises in the new covenant are guaranteed to us by Jesus himself. Most of all, he guarantees that the debt that our sins incurred or ever will will incur against us, has been paid in full. When did Jesus do this? On the cross. He paid it in full, and so he is our surety. He became our surety on that cursed tree. Uh, That word tetelestai, that he cried out on the cross, means... It is finished. It has been paid in full. And that enables you to draw even closer to God. You can draw near to God because Jesus Christ's priesthood is established by God's oath. Jesus Christ is the guarantee of a better covenant. But also, Jesus Christ's priesthood is permanent, as I pointed out before. But look at verse 23. Now, There there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. I want us to backtrack for a moment to verses 15 and 16 where we see that Jesus Christ's priesthood is permanent because it is based on the power of an indestructible life. Verses 15 to 17, look there. What we have said is even more clear if if the other priest, if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. What does that refer to? Peter preaches about this on the day of Pentecost. He says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But, verse 24, But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. His life could not be destroyed. Not even death could keep him in the grave. He raised from the dead on the third day. It goes on to say here, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body 
also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Brother, says Peter then, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. And seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. So, it was on the basis of his resurrection from the dead and indestructible life that we can draw near to God. That stands as a foundation for us as well. But then, another thing is, we are able to draw near to God because Jesus Christ, it says here, is able to save to the uttermost. Completely. Verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely, that means forever, to the uttermost, those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Hey, no Levitical priest could serve for longer than 25 years, no matter how faithful he was. Collectively, the whole system was only a temporary measure. It started in the wilderness and it ended when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. So this priesthood was only for the old covenant. And its whole purpose was to point to Christ that was going to come. The real high priest. You see, there are no such restrictions for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not limited by mortality and death and sin and time and space and human weakness. Not at all. Jesus exists forever at the Father's right hand and those words, he always lives to intercede for them, don't mean that Jesus is standing before the throne of the Father praying all the time. Uh -uh. It means that he himself is our intercession. His life, his death, his resurrection, his work on the cross stands eternally in our stead before the Holy Father. They plead our case before the Father. His blood continually pleads our case, cries out to the Father, Tetelestai, their sin debt is paid in full so that we may draw near to God eternally and be saved forever. Hey, Jesus will save you who trust in him to the uttermost forever. And lastly, through Jesus, you can really draw near to God because Jesus is able to meet your real need. Verses 26 to 28. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, and unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And for the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been made perfect forever. Let me ask you, what really prevents us from drawing near to God? What stops us from drawing near to God? What separates us from God? Sin, yes. Your sin. The guilt resulting from your sin. And sin starts in the heart. So we should say our hearts corrupted by sin separates us.
from God. This is where we have idols. And idols can be anything that you put before God, an idol. People, things, anything else. Greed. Deception. Hate. Lying. Pretense. Pride. Bitterness. Dishonesty. That is what separates us from God. He sees right into your very soul. He sees everything. He knows everything. The reality is that Judaism was weak and powerless and only a temporary measure precisely because it could not deal effectively with the sin of the, sin of the Israelites. And today we have similar things, worldly church systems, rituals, personal rituals, gimmicks, fun, whatever it might be, formulas, good works, are just as powerless to deal with your sin. Oh, my brother and sister, only Jesus can deal effectively with the thing no doctor has a cure for, no professor or any learned person has any answer for, no religion is able to heal even slightly. Jesus dealt effectively and permanently and completely with your sin problem in one powerful act for all time and eternity. He obliterated your sin yield before the holy judge of the universe. And he can powerfully transform our wicked, hard, cold hearts into ones that love God and reach us out in love to their neighbor. Such a high priest meet our need, or meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, and set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Oh, it was such an encouragement to me yesterday that the ladies and some folk here reached out to the community in mourning. People, I think, who would in, or in large, not even church people, let alone believers in Christ, yet sacrificially came and served and helped and gave unconditionally to those people. Only God can do that. Only someone who has received mercy from God and understands who they really are before God, how sinful they really are, and how lost they really were without Jesus Christ, when they are forgiven, will reach out and give something to others in need. You see, Jesus Christ graciously meets your real need, not your felt need, not your perceived need, but your sin need. And this is the message we need to spread. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. Thank you for Hebrews chapter 7. We are silent before you, Lord. What can we say against you? What can we say in our own defense but that Jesus Christ is our glorious high priest before the throne of God above? Praise your name, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for reaching down to us and for saving us from our sin and putting us on a high rock in a safe place and giving us eternal life as a free gift. Thank you, Lord. Amen.